God damn the sun. God damn the sun. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Welcome to Better Than Food. Welcome to the nightmare. It is not often that you review a book by one of your favorite musicians. But I'm happy to say I'm lucky enough to do so. But first, I'm going to start with a quote. Irony and cynicism are the killers of all possibility. Michael Giraud said that in an interview with The Guardian last year in 2014. And I hope I can assimilate those words of wisdom if I grow into old age. So if you've never been introduced to the genre of music that is known as swans, let's take a trip back to my favorite period in music history. New York City in the early 80s. Everybody is ragingly poor and music is the most exciting since Iggy Pop started smearing peanut butter on his nipples. Particularly around the Lower East Side, from what I'm told. You had musicians stripping music down at that point and creating something incredible that would later be classified as no wave, but only as a lazy term because none of the bands sounded like one another at all. You had shit going on like Mars and James Chance and the Contortions and Lydia Lunch with Teenage Jesus and then you had DNA, then Fetus, and then the birthday party over in London with Nick Cave. And then in 1982, a happy little troupe started making music by the name of Swans. Like many people who did not grow up until far after this was over, but grew up with the internet, I learned about this band through a little indie documentary a few years back called Kill Your Idols. It was documenting musicians from bands that had been a part of this time and place in music. Michael Giraud is a fascinating character with some incredible stories. Giraud was already participating in some interesting and probably what is considered pretty extreme performance art. He once was able to take part in a performance by Herman Nitsch in Los Angeles. And that makes total sense when you hear Swans now. When I discovered them, I was steeped in black metal and punk rock and what I thought was just the most extreme stuff out there. I thought I was listening to the most radical music available. I was about 15. And I learned very quickly I was very, very wrong. Thank God. There are some moments that you can measure your life by, and I don't think anything at that age of about 15, 16 had the impact, quite literally, that Swans did. I saw Swans perform in this little documentary, and I literally could not tell what I was looking at. I had no point of reference, no map for this territory. All that kind of came up in my head was some sort of ritualistic, Dionysian, sacrificial sonic exorcism. Something that made me laugh because it was so profound and disturbing there was no other reaction I had available. It's the laughter of people who eat their own shit. It was like the laugh of the Peter Laurie Looney Tunes character. <laughs> at the time I was working a dead-end fast food job in a small town and beginning to read the Marquis de Sade and Henry Miller. And I was really beginning to loathe the feeling of being a wage slave and utterly powerless. I was still living with my mom. But this was the perfect time for me to find this kind of music. A lot of people feel this type of music is very oppressive. Good. Music this powerful should divide people. Because there's a whole other group of people who find this type of music liberating. I being one of them. So needless to say, they made a hell of an impression on me. They broke up for years and years and years and years, and then they got back together fairly recently, and their sound is more powerful than ever. And of course, very different from their earlier stuff. This is not a band that repeats itself. And it's incredible. They're getting plenty of mainstream attention now, which is wonderful. I don't think I could think of another band that deserves it more. Michael Jura's stamina is profound. So of course, how does this music actually sound? Well, in Jura's own words, he would describe it as Howlin' Wolf, accompanied by Bella Bartok and Tiny Tim. Anyways, over the course of the early 80s and the early 90s, Michael Jural wrote a book. A very, very rare book that you will not be able to pick up at your local Barnes & Noble. In fact, you will probably not even be able to get a physical copy of it off of eBay for under $500. The title of Michael Jural's book, The Consumer. You can find it on the internet if you look. It exists, but you have been warned. So this was actually published by Henry Rollins with his publishing company. So what's it all about, right? It's beautifully fucked. Okay. So imagine the beat poets dug up the rotting corpse of the Marquis de Sade and reanimated him voodoo style. And then they introduced him to Los Angeles culture. 
And then instead of being the Marquis, he's forced to be homeless or work a soul-sucking dead-end job. So now there's an added degree of empathy for the pain, torment, helplessness, and crushing, depressing experience that often is life. So the book is divided into two parts. The first part is The Consumer, which is a collection of short stories. And the second part is also short stories. It's called Various Traps and Some Weaknesses. And it's far shorter pieces. Some of them are only one page. And they're slightly more abstract, a little less narrative, more expressive. But what are, what are these stories about, of course? Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to read you some of the titles and I'll just let you guess. The Coward, Why I Ate My Wife. The Consumer, Rotting Pig, which is actually divided into four short stories. My Prescription for Happiness, by The Rotting Pig. How I Learned to Speak, by The Rotting Pig. Notes on Coitus, by The Rotting Pig. Homage to My Former Self, by The Rotting Pig. The Young Man That Hid His Body Inside a Horse, or My Vulvic Los Angeles. The Sex Machine, The Great Annihilator, or Francis Bacon's Mouth. So you sort of can get an idea of what you're in for with this one. A great time, of course. Sure, it's nasty and disgusting imagery, but Girard can compose the fuck out of a sentence. The description of viscera and intimate self-hatred and horror at one's own body and mental, physical condition. It's nauseating and it's polarizing and blah 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 blah, but forget the dismissive, negative, lazy tropes just for a second and allow yourself to experience the stories. Allow yourself to experience the layers of like tragedy and cruelty and lust and shame beneath all of it. And there are even moments of total comedy layered in for good measure. It is wise literature. It is human. It is literature that feels like the person behind the pen was more concerned with learning how to live than learning how to write about living. It breathes. And yes, it stinks, but it's intoxicating. It ignites the senses. It's literary gasoline. It's good shit. Way, way better than food. In fact, while you're reading this, I suggest you take a pork tenderloin, wrap it in bacon and canola oil, bake it for an hour, and then stuff your face with it after you've rubbed your body up with baby oil and goat's blood. Remember what John Waters said, if you go home with somebody and they don't have books, don't fuck them. Not that you would be in the mood for doing anything of the sort after you read this book, but it's magnificent. Highly recommended. Have a great day.